Three years earlier, one of Mr. H's thugs had turned up with some papers and told Makina that it said right there that they owned a little piece of land over on the other side of the river that a gentleman had left it to them. This is what sets the narrative of signs preceding the end of the world going. Makina's brother setting off to the big Chilango to find the land supposedly owed to them. This is fantasy land, land that is ever elusive, land that, of course, we discover doesn't even exist in the end. And yet, the idea of the land calls to Makina's brother, and therefore Makina herself is summoned to verse through the land, to verse through the landscape. I wanted to talk about landscape because when we think about the border, and arguably about Mexico in general, landscape figures heavily in the idea of visual depiction of national and or regional identity. Following the revolution, artists emphasized particular aspects of the Mexican landscape, significantly among them painter Gerardo Murillo, known as Dr. Atl, who crafted a Mexican aesthetic of a sort that emphasized vast spaces and curvilinear perspective in his paintings from the early 1930s. This further influenced muralists like David Siqueiros, and then filmmakers, especially director Emilio El Indio Fernandez and cinematographer Gabriel Figueroa, whose own aesthetic defined how Mexico would be depicted in the beginning of the 1940s. The cinematic images throughout this video essay, taken from a number of more contemporary films, might be seen to reflect the legacy of this depiction of landscape and how popular culture tends to use it to reflect Mexico and the border. I mention all of this because I find it striking that despite the land driving Makino's brother to the north, Herrera barely describes the land in signs preceding the end of the world at all. Perhaps the cover of the book invites us to think of the land with its arid deserts across the Rio Grande, cacti, desert, unyielding. But these aren't commented on in the narrative. When Makina is still traveling by bus to the border, she comments on what she knows to be out in the darkness. She looked out at the country, mushrooming on the other side of the glass. She knew what it contained, its colors, the penury and the opulence, hazy memories of a less cynical time, villages emptied of men. But on contemplating the tense stillness of the night, the darkness dotted here and there with sparks, she wondered vaguely what the hell might be festering out there. What grows? And what rots when you're looking the other way? We are left to imagine what these colors actually are, even as those images are tinged more with memory than with precision. We are thus invited as readers to fill in those images with whatever knowledge we bring to this book. Not to mention the fellow passengers on this bus who might not have such memories are no help whatsoever. Herrera writes, the youngsters kept their distance the remainder of the trip. They crossed the entire country without one comment on the view. Makina's actual border crossing is the point where she most directly interacts with the earth, be it the river or the mountainous region that follows. Chapter two, the water crossing, begins with a passage that concentrates on the dangers of Makina's footsteps, leaving marks on real land. She couldn't get lost. Every time she came to the big Chilango, she trod softly because that was not the place she wanted to leave her mark. And she told herself repeatedly that she couldn't get lost. And by get lost, she meant not a detour or a sidetrack, but lost for real, lost forever in the hills of hills cementing the horizon. When she gets to the river crossing itself, this is perhaps the part where we are most clearly invited to think of landscape. Joss Begley's fascinating short film, Best of Luck with the Wall, directly inspired by signs preceding, shows us only the land, only the spaces, taken from above with Google images, interlaced as it winds through more desert and river.
Makina herself, however, barely mentions the river as an entity unto itself, even as it threatens to pull her under. Chucho and Makina tip over into the water from the raft, and suddenly the world turned cold and green, and filled with invisible water monsters dragging her away from the rubber raft. Instead, once Makina gets to the other side of the river, as with cinematographer Figueroa before her, she concentrates on the sky. They lay on the shore, spent and panting. It had hardly been more than a few dozen yards, but on staring up at the sky, Makina thought it was already different, more distant and less blue. Perhaps this is an effort to destabilize the actual location of this narrative. Herrera pointedly never says where this novel is set, never uses the word Mexico or United States or any real life place markers. Perhaps this creates a more mystical atmosphere that surrounds the novel that tends towards magic realism of a sort. The most evocative passage and the only place where the word landscape appears in the entire book comes in the final sentences as Makina emerges to whatever comes next. She thought back to her people as they were calling the contours of a lovely landscape that was now fading away. The village, the little town, the big Chilango, all those colors. And she saw that what was happening was not a cataclysm. She understood with all of her body and all of her memory. She truly understood. And when everything in the world fell silent, finally said to herself, I'm ready. Or perhaps the real destabilizing aspect of this book is that it challenges all of these notions we have of the border to begin with, especially those of us looking at the border from places where we are less than familiar with the border, such as Mexico City or the United States. I mentioned that the cover itself may give us an indication of what this landscape is supposed to look like, but this is the cover of the English translation. The Spanish version has a completely different cover, one that more accurately depicts how Makina goes through this border world, through streets, tunnels, subways, and other markers of urbanity that mark both sides. Makina rarely stops to consider what the landscape looks like because she is less interested in the land herself. Indeed, after the crossing, we get the following exchange. Hey there, he said, as soon as he was out of the water. So you're going over for a little land, I hear. Ah, said Makina, land's the one thing we've got enough of. I'm going for my bro. He's the stupid sap who went over for a little land. Herrera's lack of landscape makes this narrative far less romantic. The spare descriptions relegating the narrative to more urban spaces clashes with what we expect on the border, fully destabilizing. Makina's brother writes in his first note back to his family, I still haven't found the land yet, but it won't be long now, we'll see. And then, the second one didn't even mention the country, or the land, or his plans. The signs preceding the end of the world are not what we expect, and they fade in deference to what is important for Makina, the people, the mission, the urban, all of which challenge our notions of nationhood and the border. 